Welcome. Good afternoon, Club 17. Great to be here. We have a number of guests with us to, today as well, and we have a lot of friends and members on Zoom joining us. So we're going to get going uh, with the Pledge of Allegiance. Please join me. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And now Bonnie Reddick is gonna lead us in our invocation and four-way test. Okay, this is Johnny. <laughs> An inexperienced invocationer. <laughs> so this is it. The Lord is good to me, and so I thank the Lord for giving us great families in Rotary. The Lord is good to me. All right. Oh, let's do. This. Let's go on. All right. Is it the truth? Is it all fair to all concerned? Would I give better goodwill and better friendships? Well, it can be beneficial for all concerned. Thank you, thank you. Yep, seats. Thank you, Bonnie. We appreciate it, and it was much better to have you sing than to have me sing. So that, that, was, that was good. Uh, we're good. You can take it with you. Take it with you. So now we're uh, going to have a time to introduce some of our guests today. And... Uh, first of all, we have Kevin Bass visiting from 10XTS. Uh, he is a guest of Bob Beekner. Uh, welcome, Kevin. If, if you could just stand up. If you could stand up a minute, too. It's good. Th thank you. Thanks for coming. And our next guest is Nandini Kumar, who is a guest of Melinda Kelly. Oh, okay. On Zoom, maybe. And we've got uh, Andrea Tall from First Commonwealth Bank, and she's a guest of Esteban Calle. And Clark Becker from Sunbelt Business Advisors of Southwest Ohio is a guest of Melinda Kelly. Welcome. And Peter McColgan from Wells Fargo, who's a guest of Bob Beekner. Welcome, Peter. And now we've got a sponsorship moment. Uh, very pleased to have Scott Hoberg join us. His law firm, Deaver Hoberg, is sponsoring today's meeting. Thanks, President Brett. Good afternoon, Club 17. I hope everybody is doing well today. Uh, move this down a little bit. How's that? Okay. So, uh, my name's Scott Hoberg at Deaver and Hoberg. Uh, I know I was here in front of everybody last year to talk a little bit about the importance of estate planning, but today we were, I was going to spend some of my time this morning uh, discussing uh, actually a practice area that uh, we've been able to drill down with even more so at Deaver and Hoberg over the past year, uh, specifically the real estate. Uh, uh, area of practice. We've added on a uh, full-time attorney who is actually dealing primarily with real estate issues at our firm. Uh, and that includes, you know, standard buy-sell agreements as well as other matters uh, involving real estate such as title. So certainly, if you ever have any questions involving any of those aspects, please please feel free to reach out to me, whether you're in, uh, you know, here in person or over on Zoom, and we'd be happy to kind of riff with you and try to figure out uh, you know, how we can help bring about a solution. Um, other than that, uh, that's pretty much all I have here today, other than you know, I think we're going to have a really great speaker here today with Michael Hiles, who actually is a, uh, you know, hosts a cod podcast with my uh, you know, law partner, Jonathan Deaver. So uh, you know, please feel free to check that out and subscribe if you haven't already. And, and Scott, thanks so much for being a sponsor for our club, a sponsor for this meeting. We appreciate it. 
And now we've got an exciting announcement that our membership director, Deanne Fleming, is going to give on a new campaign called Save Local. everyone. I'm, it's nice to be back. Happy March. Um, we do have a very exciting program today um, that I'm introducing called Save Local. And um, one of Rotary International's seven focus areas is growing local economies. And in following this, our club wants to support local businesses while also supporting our local mission of caring for children with disabilities. We have a project that will accomplish both of these goals and you can help. Um, the people that are joining us today see on your table the flyer for Save Local and those of you at home should have received one by email today from uh, President Brett. So during the month of March, we are teaming with 3CDC for Save Local, a campaign to support local businesses. It's estimated that nearly 7.5 small businesses are at risk of closing their doors. Let's see what we can do to prevent this. So this is how it works. With every card purchased, the club will purchase a matching gift card, and both will be donated to the silent auction at Believe to Achieve. Our club will contribute $15,000 matching funds to this campaign. Believe to achieve. I agree. So believe to achieve. Our club's annual fundraiser is slated for August 7th, 2021. Oh, that's not the right slide, but OK, we can move right on to that. Let's move. There we go. Um, August 7th, 2021 at Brain Brew. By supporting this Save Local campaign, the benefits are twofold. Our local businesses and Believe to Achieve will um, benefit. Please, I'm sorry, please help to support the Down Syndrome of Greater Cincinnati, Stepping Stones for Camp Allen, and New This Year, Visionaries and Voices, which is an art program for disabled children and adults. Next slide, oh, that's me. David Edwards, a valued Rotarian, has already participated in this campaign. I'd like to share a few words from a recent email he sent. I talked to him this morning and he approves this. This is what he wrote to Brett. The new gift card program and involvement in it has been the highlight of my C19 year. It has made me feel so good to be able to be involved in these people's lives in such a positive way. I can only say that being part of Club 17 has changed me into a much better person. Let the other club members know that being part of this new program will increase their feeling of self-worth and improve the quality of life in Cincinnati. What a great thing to do. We appreciate your efforts, David, and we do thank you. Next slide. That's from David Edwards, yes. Those are his words. And slide four. There's our Carl Kappas and his purchase at the art resource team. His gift card is donated to the silent auction, and the club will then purchase another gift card from the art resource team to be added to the Believe to Achieve silent auction. And when Carl came in today, he's upping his ante and his efforts. He's brought me a gift card from Vonda Har Catering, Gabby's Cafe, and also the Wyoming Meat Market. So Carl's out there doing his work, good work, and we need to join him. And one more. This is how it works. President Brett has sent members an email, all members this morning, detailing the Save Local program. Your table has the sheet as well, the flyer. Look for it in your um, email and inbox. Here's how it works. You buy a gift card, you purchase a gift card at a local restaurant or small business. You send it along with the form to the Rotary office. The Rotary Office, or the Rotary Club, which is me, will contact the business where you purchase the gift card and purchase another gift card of the same value. Or, if you don't want to bother with going out to purchase one, uh, contact the 
uh, Rotary office and or click the donate button on our website and we'll make the purchase for you and then we'll double the donation. It's a great program. I hope you participate and I thank everyone. And thank you so much for that. That was a great announcement, a great program, really looking forward to it. And I think we can really make a difference for a number of small businesses in the area and have some fun and get some joy as we, we do that to support our community. So we've got some other announcements today. We're gonna to start with birthdays. March 2nd, Terry Boeing. March 3rd, Bill Henrick. Today, Jack Horner and Corbin Scherzinger. March 5th, K.L. Allen, and March 8th, Owen Rassman. Let's wish them all a happy birthday. And I want to also thank everybody in our club who donated at Hawksworth Blood Centers over the past month. That was great to have that participation by club members. Again, meeting a very important community need as we as Rotarians fight disease. So I've got a fun announcement. Doesn't baseball sound good right about now? Yeah, so we, so we are going to have a rotary after hours at the Great American Ballpark. Uh, it will be on May 21st at 7, 10 p.m. And we'll have the whole center field pavilion for our club, which is a really great spot. Uh, we'll have a, this will include a buffet, and we've got private indoor seating for the buffet, but we also have access to an outdoor deck. And the buffet will have uh, a lot of different things, uh, miniature hamburgers, beef hot dogs, grilled bratwurst, uh, pasta salad, you name it, I could list them all. Very good. Of course, it's going to have ballpark peanuts and popcorn, and unlimited Water and soft drinks and two beer tickets are included, all for the price of $95. So it's a great deal. Uh, should be a lot of fun to come and watch the Reds beat the Brewers that night. And uh, if you want to come, just go to E-Rays and you'll see a form to fill out, send to the Rotary office. You just have to make a reservation by May 14th, but I'd encourage you to get on it early. Don't wait too long. So, uh, members in the news, congratulations to our corporate member, Michael Smith of Baird, who was named Forbes 2021 Best in State Wealth Advisor recipient. Michael is a financial advisor with the Deutsch Smith and Colangelo Group. Congratulations, Michael. And for our next Thursday meeting, our speaker will be Barbara Turner, the CEO of Ohio National Financial Services. And now let's switch gears to today's program. Uh, we're very pleased to have with us Michael Hiles. Michael is the founder and CEO of 10XTS. A number of people in our club know Michael. Uh, Michael was telling me today that this is his first time out of uh, the house with more than shorts and a t-shirt on in a long time. So we're, we're very glad to give this social opportunity, this person-to-person -person opportunity. Uh, Michael began his career in the early 1990s as a software developer, and in, by 1995 he'd founded his own firm, SoftLinks Interactive, one of the first web development companies in the Cincinnati area. And he brought that web technology to industry uh, as he joined a GovTech business, a software provider, where his team won a Smithsonian Laureate Award for their work. In 2016, he launched the Cincinnati chapter of the Founder Institute, which is the local branch for the Silicon Valley-based Global Accelerator. And in 2017, he started 10XTS. He's a native of the west side of Cincinnati, and currently resides in Eaton Township up in Preble County above Miami University. Please join me in welcoming Michael Hiles to the Rotary Club of Cincinnati. Thank you, President Brett. 
Thank you, everybody. This is indeed my first live speaking engagement in over a year, so you'll have to forgive me if I stumble or I uh, say something silly. My children proudly announced to me, Dad, this is the first time we've seen you in jeans or in something other than sweats and a t-shirt in quite a long time. So uh, here I am hopefully presenting, presentable today. So uh, I want to thank Rotary for sponsoring me today, Dever Hoberg, um, yeah, as, as uh, Mr. Hoberg said, my uh, co-host and partner in crime for a lot of this stuff, Jonathan Deaver is his partner at uh, Deaver Hoberg. So we, we do have a podcast called Digital Dollar where we've had some interesting guests and I think we have about, well, I think a couple people told me today that they've listened to it so we have at least five or six listeners now, so <laughs> pretty excited. So today I want to talk to you about a topic near and dear to my heart. Um, we're a technology company, but we're specifically a, a financial technology company and a regulatory technology company sort of combined into one. And so one of the topics that I get asked a lot about is how do I raise money with this blockchain stuff? Bitcoin's like this big, huge thing, and I've heard that people are using blockchain technology to raise capital for their businesses. How does that work? So I'll skip over my uh, boring slide since uh, President Brett did a great job of uh, introducing me. <clears throat> fintech, how many of you here have heard the term fintech? A few, financial technology. And it's creating this disruptive force across all of financial services and capital markets. There's literally no financial services or capital markets company entity that is not in some way being radically impacted by technology right now. One of the big things that's happening is disintermediation. Just like the internet disintermediated a lot of, uh, you know, the travel agency business, you know, a lot of intermediaries on the information side, FinTech is starting to do that on the financial services side. Also, the automation of backroom processes. Uh, competition for traditional funding sources is starting to emerge, where you have technology companies that are functioning as fully licensed chartered banks. So banks are scrambling to try to figure out what their role is in all of this brave new world. And ultimately, being a technology guy, we tend to do this depreciative type of thing. We reduce costs through automation. Um, and that helps obviously increase yield on the back end for shareholders, which is very important as business owners. Blockchain technology is most often recognized by Bitcoin. How many in here have heard of Bitcoin now? Awesome. Several years ago when I started doing these speaking engagements and talking about Bitcoin, you'd ask uh, you know, random audience, how many people have heard of Bitcoin and like one in a hundred would raise their hand. Now everybody's heard of it. It's trading above 50,000 again today for a single Bitcoin. It's not going away. In fact, Apple has now allocated a significant amount, a couple billion dollars out of treasury to hold Bitcoin. That trend will continue. It's starting to be perceived as if we don't hold Bitcoin on balance sheet, somehow or another we may be missing the boat for our fiduciary responsibility to our shareholders. Well, there's only so many of them. It's not going away, and there's only so many of them to go around. So supply and demand being what it is, eventually there'll be a price equilibrium, but we're in a big growth curve. So there's really multiple kinds of Bitcoins. A Bitcoin is really what's called a token. Now, I'm not gonna get into a primer of the technology and glaze everybody's eyes over today, but what I want you to understand is the technology that powers Bitcoin also powers many other forms of similar uses of the same technology. So you have cryptocurrency at the top. We've all heard of Bitcoin, Litecoin. There's a lot of just payment currencies. And then there's utility tokens. It's a little electronic token that you have in an account wallet somewhere, and it's used to do something useful on a computer network somewhere. And then they have this new thing that's coming out these days called an NFT or a non-fungible token. It represents a unique, like a piece of art, for example, or a song, rights to a, a song. It's like a, you know, the person who has this NFT token that represents this song is the rightful owner of the intellectual property of the song itself. And then they have these newfangled products, these financial products called DeFi, Decentralized Finance. And that's where they're using the same technology to do interesting derivatives, lending products. And then ultimately, where MySpace is, 
we tokenize real world assets. A long time ago, we figured out we could use the same Bitcoin technology to then take a real world asset and create an, a digital version of the ownership of that real world asset and then fractionalize it into many little pieces and little bits. And so we'll focus on that today because that's how we raise money using blockchain technology. So earlier in the Bitcoin blockchain life cycle, people got this idea could raise capital by selling these tokens to finance our projects. And they were called ICOs, initial coin offerings. And they exploded in popularity on a global basis. In fact, in 2018, from January to June alone, $13 billion was raised for projects using this nascent brand new technology to sell these tokens, which represented some state in the project, some way that you can participate in the project. It's a lot of money that happened really, really fast. And of course, like everything cool, the regulators come along and say, no, nah, baby, no. Nah. We got these things called SEC regulations, and you are in violation. And in fact, Jay Clayton, the former SEC chair, said every single ICO that he ever saw was a security. So what do they do with people that sell unregistered securities at the federal level? Well, federal marshals get warrants, and they kick down the door and hopefully don't shoot your dog. But... Uh, people end up in federal court over these things. And there's been a series of cases that have found their way into federal courtrooms over the past few years subsequent to, and it really icebergged the entire industry. People stopped trying to raise capital using these blockchain token sales. So back in 2018, I was invited to speak in Congress. I get to testify. I guess people like my ideas about things every now and then. And my whole premise of my testimony was don't kill the technology. We have a dire need in America to fund small businesses. And this becomes an interesting new and novel way that if we can figure out how to blend the technology with regulatory compliance, this becomes a great avenue for small businesses all over America to leverage the platform to finance projects, to finance their company. So what we've been working on and what the regulators seem to be liking is these things called regulatory compliant digital security tokens. Not only are they accepted by the SEC and the regulators as a form of tracking investments, but it is becoming the new market infrastructure itself. Lots of new exchanges, alternative trading systems, ATSs, are popping up that specialize in this type of technology. Broker dealers, literally every layer of the capital markets stack has players that are licensed reporting entities that are now working in this technology space. Once again, this is not going away. It's becoming the new infrastructure. So let's talk specifically about what is asset tokenization. It's a boring definition. The process of converting traditional securities into digital securities using distributed ledger technology, i.e. blockchain, to bring benefits of efficiency, accessibility, and liquidity to private market investors. So asset owners, everyday people such as yourself, can tokenize Real estate, art, companies, shares, funds, limited partnership units, right? Anything that can be identified on a, we like to call them dead tree carcasses, but a piece of paper that came out of the law firm, right? Anything that could be enumerated and identified on paper can be put into this digital form. Well, why would we want to do that? The technology already proved itself as incredibly viable as a vehicle to raise money from a brand new form of investor, right? Younger people especially. And you talk to millennials and younger, right? They're the ones that are driving this market, right? They're the ones that have driven the adoption. They're excited about the idea that, hey, at some point I could log into my Robinhood app and buy alternative assets using this technology as easily as I can trade in AAPL or Tesla, right? 
So the other thing that's really exciting is you don't have to sell the whole asset. You can run what we call a fractional liquidity model. So there's been some really cool projects that I'll talk about here in a little bit that shows how people can get liquidity but not necessarily surrender entire ownership of their asset. So now digital securities tokens, they're sold in what's called a security token offering, an STO, or a digital securities offering, a DSO. And that's where a blockchain token is sold to investors via a regulatory compliant offering. It can be equity, it can be debt, it can be special purpose vehicle ownership, it can be you know, just a regular old investment contract of sorts. Um, the cool thing about it and what we specialize in, where we saw the exciting future, was it's programmable. So now we can automate features about that investment that would ordinarily be in a contract at the law firm, you know, at the office at the law firm, right? We can automate things that happen instantaneously because it's been programmed into the token or the security itself. And that's really super exciting. And what that means is, is it allows us to automate issuance. Right? How many people here, how many have raised capital before for your business or for investors? Raise your hand. A few. Okay? It's kind of a pain in the rear process, isn't it? Right? It's paper laden and you have to, you know, get signatures and, you know, work with transfer agents and all these people. Right? All of that back office settlement can now be completely automated. Right? In the securities market, it used to take days to settle a transaction literally because of all of the paper-laden, human-powered process that we had to go through to finally settle a buy-sell agreement. The technology already exists today to literally go to what they call T plus zero, trade plus zero time. The holdup's regulatory, right? The holdup is the rest of the industry catching up, but the technology exists today so that instantaneous settlement occurs. Now, the other cool thing is, is the token doesn't have to have the same characteristics as stock. You can theoretically separate voting governance away from dividend participation, right? It just gives a lot of flexibility to the issuer that's raising capital to come up with new and interesting novel ways to provide investors with uh, returns and protections, but then, you know, split hairs a little bit. It gets really fun and creative. So ownership rights profits, profit sharing, right, dividends that are all assigned to traditional, that can all be separated out. It can be different now. It still requires licensed folks. The average person can't just wander in and sell a token, right? It still requires a broker dealer. It still requires licensed folks to be part of this process. So now let's talk about the actual equity side, the share way. If I'm a business owner, how do I raise money for my company, right? The great thing is, is there's been some new forms of capital formation over the past several years that small businesses can even leverage, right? So we're going to talk about some exempted offerings. Now, I'm not an attorney by any stretch of the imagination. There's some great ones in the room. Uh, the attorneys in the room can correct me if I say something stupid or wrong, but uh, I pay enough of them and I listen to what they have to say. So I figure I've at least picked something up here and there. So these are the forms of exempted offerings. Ordinarily, if I sell shares in my company, I have to register with the SEC, go public, basically. However, they give us these great exemptions that if we qualify, we can raise money and meet certain requirements, and it allows us to create a share sale and raise capital for our business, but then not have to go through all of the onerous reporting. So let's talk about Reg CF, Regulation Crowdfunding. This was passed into law under the Title III Jobs Act back in 2012. In response to business and in industry in general, the SEC says there's got to be a way to allow small businesses to raise capital on a limited basis while still protecting shareholders. Because, you know, the Consumer Finance Protection Bureau is always standing there shaking their stick at everyone. But it, it's tantamount to what we like to call an Internet IPO. And it's really easy to raise now up to $5 million. Uh, last year, the rule was changed, and it's still sort of pending. Uh, I think the current administration has a uh, rule freeze uh, pending review, but I think that this one's going to get through. 
it raised it from a million to five million. So you as a small business can file what's called a Form C, and then it allows unaccredited investors, means people that aren't high net worth, they can now buy shares in your company through this proper channel. It still requires licensed folks. You have to sell the shares through a, a portal, a, you know, licensed crowdfunding portal. You still have to have a transfer agent and custodial escrow and all of those things. And then ultimately, that share can be transferable and tradable after 12 months. So it's a great new way. Well, we've worked on projects where we've done this, but instead of selling a paper share of a company and on, on paper, it's a digital token, right? So we've tokenized the shares in a crowdfunding offering. The, the big daddy on this is it also created the tier one and tier two regulation A offerings. This is like a mini actual IPO. A little bit more expensive, you can spend a couple hundred grand in legal and uh, various costs that go along with this, but allows you to raise, depending on the tier, up to 50 million or $75 million in a single year. And you're eligible for direct registration at that point. You can register on OTC or NASDAQ. Got to go through a little extra auditing, which increases the cost. But it essentially allows unaccredited investors, regular folks, middle income folks, to buy into the company as a share sale uh, without being high net worth. And it's tradable, right? It, 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 because it's a, it's a quasi-public stock, it can now be tradable. And that's important. Tradability is important because people want liquidity for their investments. Nothing's worse than putting a lot of money into something and you can't get it back out. Then, of course, you have Reg S. It's been around for a while. That's an offshore exemption. This means that you sell shares in your project or your company, but it's offshore only. You have to ensure that that stock, that equity, that security can never come back to the United States to U.S. investors. It gets complicated. But because of the global nature of blockchain and the popularity of the technology, it's also an important consideration. And you can run a Reg S off to other offerings as well. And then you have the good old-fashioned Reg D private placements. That's where high net worth individuals are sold shares in a company. You have to be accredited, which means you either have a liquid net worth of a million or more, not counting your primary residence, or you've made a couple hundred grand a year or 300 grand a year as a couple with the expectation to continue making that much money. Um, and then you're allowed to buy in. You're allowed to sell this. There's about 12, 15 million people in America that meet the qualifications for this. And of course, these are highly illiquid. These are limited partnership units and funds. These are you know, yeah, just any form of private equity paper that uh, people use to raise capital. Now, what's interesting is, is I'm working with some uh, you know, pretty progressive law firms. They're coming up with some new structures to shorten that tradability time from 12 months down to six months. And under Reg D, you can do this thing called a qualified institutional buyer, where there's rules around what a QIB is, a bank, um, you know, investment companies that meet certain criteria. But when you give that Reg D offering up to those folks on the front end, that shortens the tradability time from 12 months to six months in a day. So now it becomes freely tradable on that secondary market, and unaccredited folks can actually buy and sell and trade those instruments after the fact. So these are some of the paths of how we get there. Now, I mentioned earlier that there have been some cool products. The St. Regis Aspen Resort in Colorado, they went through a tokenization project. They tokenized the hotel, and they sold, not the whole hotel, they sold, they oversubscribed. They were originally only going to sell 18%. They sold 18.9% due to the demand. And so there's fractional ownership where people can buy in hundred dollars, five hundred dollars at a time and have a participation in in the project. So they raised a bunch of money and um, it's, it's a pretty cool marquee project, one of the first. There are now literally billions of dollars in assets in the pipeline. We're working on a project right now. It's a big project in Florida. It's $45 million property that's being tokenized. They only want to run a fractional liquidity model for about 20 to 30 percent max and that gives them the flexibility that they can raise capital but don't have to dispose of the whole property they can still retain majority ownership 
They just sell a little bit of it. And that's new and novel that's brought about by all this great technology. So this is going to be an interesting chart because uh, it's real tiny. But when you trade, when you buy and sell shares of stock, these are all of the players that are involved, right? You've got the issuer up in the top corner, right? Megacorp, whatever, company. And then immediately you'll see a transfer agent. The transfer agent is the official recorder of the shares. We are one of the first fully digital transfer agents recognized by the SEC in existence. So taking the old school transfer agent function and moving it to this blockchain world, these cryptocurrency versions of tradable equities, this is where the future is going, right? And then you've got, of course, depository trust and all the clearing and the broker dealers and the custodians on the buy side, the sell side, and everybody, you know, trading back and forth. But when I said before about digital tokens becoming the new market infrastructure, every single one of those boxes has players in the space that is now working with this technology. This is going to wipe out all of the technology as we've known it. Now, the great thing about Cincinnati is most people don't know this. Cincinnati Stock Exchange was the very first stock exchange to ever do electronic trading. Most people don't know that. There's actually a website out there. I think it's UC or somebody maintains a historical website about that. But Cincinnati's got some cool fintech firsts, and we like being part of that legacy. Fifth Third, right? The Genie Network. They invented the ATM industry. Right? Cincinnati Stock Exchange, the first to do electronic trading. And so hopefully we're in a position now, we're hoping to drive forward with that iteration, that evolution as a company, and, com and compress all of those people that are involved in a, in a security transaction. They've got their own separate computer systems, their own databases, their own technology. Well, that's why it still takes at least a couple days to settle a transaction. We want to see T plus zero. We want to see a share transfer instantaneous, funds transferred, and it's automatically recorded across all of those players. We don't think that the SEC is ever going to get rid of broker dealers or transfer agents. Quite the contrary. We think that the technology is going to provide a resurgence of some of these industries because of the opportunities that are going to be created. For those that have been in capital markets, there's been a consolidation and, and you know, consolidating the broker-dealer market and the banking market's all been consolidated upwards. And there's going to be boutique operations that focus just in certain asset classes with this technology. Right? So it's a great new opportunity for uh, a resurgence in finance and capital based on the tech. So 10XTS is my company, 10XTS.com. We're pretty easy to find. We help enterprises and governments create next generation decentralized record management systems with our advanced APIs, really boring language here, like nerdy tech talk, right? The point is we try to make this stuff easy. We're considered experts in the space. We've amassed a lot of legal talent, financial securities talent, technology talent, all under one roof, right here in little old Cincinnati. And so our platform technology is called XDEX, Extensible Index. And then our transfer agent is Ledger Lab. So we've worked to define a process. We've got a six-step process that we take clients through. If you're thinking about raising capital for a project, you're thinking about liquidity for real estate uh, and want to explore these things, we have a very well-defined consultation that we take people through. And then ultimately, who can issue? Well, companies, entities, and funds. We work just as much with venture capital funds and uh, limited partnership funds for different types of uh, projects. And so to give you an example, we're partners with, uh, in fact, Bob Beekner is a partner with the Cincinnati Crypto Fund. We formed a, a cryptocurrency hedge fund. We use the platform to manage the limited partnership interests in cryptocurrencies. So a lot of people are interested in investing in Bitcoin and they want to dabble in this space, but they don't want to mess with the technology. The technology is too complicated and I don't blame you. So we created a small fund that allows the average high net worth person who's not interested in institutional million dollar check sizes, we'll take those too, but it's targeted for you know a $25,000 check size to get that exposure to the volatility of that market, but you don't have to mess with the tech. We use the platform to manage all of the aspects 
of that fund. We've got an Opportunity Zone fund, OZGP. All right, Opportunity Zone funds, you may or may not have heard of those. They require you to pay for 10 years, the horizon. So we're automating the management of Opportunity Zone investments because, well, once again, liquidity is a problem. And if you've got to hold a position for 10 years for the tax preference, you got to figure out, well, what do I do if I need to sell this thing off on the back end? Um, we work with family office, uh, Hyperion Wealth Management, uh, multifamily office, um, working literally to automate the entire back office of all of their back end settlement as a broker dealer. And then a venture fund, uh, Loud Capital. We've got a, a great relationship and they've got multiple funds out of Columbus. Um, so there's just some of the types of projects that we've worked with already. So if you have any other questions, I'd love to open that up because I know that this is like drinking from a fire hose whenever I speak. Uh, thank you so much, Michael. Great presentation. Thank you. And we do, we do have time for questions. And as a reminder for people on Zoom, you've got my cell phone number. Text me a question and I'll repeat the question into the mic. And Michael, if you could repeat any questions that come from members who are here, guests here uh, in the hotel. Absolutely. So uh, let's go ahead and open it up. Questions? Mr. Beekner. That's a great question. I'll repeat it for the, for the recording in the Zoom. Uh, Mr. Beekner asked, how can we justify the energy costs that go into mining Bitcoin because of carbon emissions and these other things that go along with it? And that's been a, it's been a debated point of contention. Now, what I can tell you is there's more than one way to skin a cat when it comes to arriving at the truth, the mining side of it. Computers are consuming lots of energy to these very complex math problems. That's how this technology works. So the estimation is now that all of the Bitcoin mining globally consumes on par of by, by the nation of Ireland on a daily basis, the same amount of electricity. So it's hard to meet your ESG mandates as a company if you're participating in something that consumes so much electricity. What I can tell you is, is that the industry response has been seeking inexpensive forms of production. So wherever there's cheap electric production, you're going to find Bitcoin mining operations, geothermal, solar, right, hydropower. In fact, these particular forms of power generation, the advancement and the investment in those alternative forms of production have been largely driven by the Bitcoin mining industry who's seeking ways to cheapen, flatten the cost of the actual consumption of the electricity. Now, there are other ways to arrive at the same mathematical truth that do not require the same amount of computational power. Those obviously do not require the same amount of electricity. So there's some alternatives and there's some options that are there. I don't have the ultimate answer to what that power consumption is other than over time it will force a exploration and uh, investment in those alternative forms of energy production to continue to produce the Bitcoin. Right here.
So the question was ultimately pertaining to federal regulations and compliance because those continue to increase, not decrease, and how does that impact the overall space, even in terms of making recommendations to potential investor clients as a RIA or a wealth manager? And that's a great question. As a regulatory technology company, we like regulation. Bring it on. <laughs> because we're in the business of automating the workflow processes. Now, the great thing is, is we've got a new SEC chair, Gary Gensler. Um, I think, I, did, I didn't hear yesterday if he actually got confirmed, but I think he will. Um, he taught a Bitcoin class at MIT. People automatically in the technology space have assumed that because someone's with the government that they have no idea what they're talking about when it comes to the technology. I've spent a lot of time on the advisory side of the government so hopefully they're smarter, if for no other reason, because of folks like me and our involvement. But I can tell you there's a lot of bright folks that are working in the regulatory capacities that do get the technology and, to your point, the balance between consumer finance and protection, how to keep people from shooting themselves in the foot, which was your metaphor. You know, somebody runs into the RIA office and says, liquidate all of my equity portfolio. I want to put it all in Bitcoin. Right? How does an RIA respond to that? I don't have an answer. You know, if somebody's 22 years old, then that's probably an okay conversation. If they're 78, um, you know, they may not get the same response. Um, the, there's been, even in the past couple of weeks, a lot of advisory come out of the SEC around digital assets. Heightened increase of uh, oversight and um, warning from the regulators, look folks, this is still a high risk proposition. It is, right? There's no doubt about it. This is pure market behavior. As people ask me, well, what's a Bitcoin worth? Well, what's anything worth? What somebody's willing to pay for it? If you ask me what the intrinsic core value of this thing is that doesn't even exist, really, in the real world, it's just this unit of account on some electronic network somewhere. If the lights go out, Right? It doesn't exist anymore, sort of. But it's really market demand, market behavior, right? People get into the question about the economics of belief, right? I have this belief that this Bitcoin's worth $50,000. Therefore, I'm willing to pay that because I think it's going to be worth 100000 by the end of the year. I don't know. I don't have that kind of crystal ball. What I do know is market behavior dictates that there is interest in, you, know, you can get a, you know, I could do a whole entire session on the decoupling of, uh, you know, assets from the fiat monetary system, <laughs> which is another big topic I, we talk about a lot. But people are seeking, number one, forms of investment. There's so much available cash in the market right now that's just looking for places to park it th that have good return with risk mitigation strategy attached to it. And, and so the asset allocation portfolio, you know, when you, when you start talking about portfolio management, well, you usually have this high risk, high return sort of slice here of a couple percent. It's your Vegas money, right? What's it hurt to put 1% of my net worth into these new forms of, of investment? I don't think the SEC takes a dim view of a balanced approach. Um, but definitely follow the warnings, you know, follow, follow, the, follow the statements. Um, I'm good friends with a lot of folks at the SEC, and uh, they're on it. They're, they're, you know, they're, they're staying. And they're, we have advocates for the technology in the, the department now. So uh, Hester Peirce, Gary Gensler, these folks are all very familiar with the technology. They want the innovation to continue forward. They want to see the innovation in the space with a balanced approach, consumer protection. I have a question from uh, one of our members on Zoom, Paula Ash, and it had to do with your St. Regis Hotel uh, example in, yeah. a in Aspen. She was just asking, what's the difference between something like that and a timeshare? Well, I don't know that they ascribed any timeshare rights to the token holders, but you could, right? You certainly have the flexibility to say if you hold so many St. Regis Aspen tokens that you get your two weeks. That could certainly be part of the 
conversation. I don't believe they did that. I believe that that's participatory rights and the, the profits coming from the property uh, in more of a traditional securities fashion. But without question, there's been a lot of discussion around, um, you know, like co-working spaces or um, you know, multi, multi-use real estate where uh, the token is tied to your uh, security pass and you use that to get in the door to even access the property. So lots of cool things. Once you move it to that technology level and it can be programmable, it's very creative. Sky's the limit. So. Sure, good question. Um, so we go back to the, we'll go back a couple slides here to the process. Um, do, 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 there we go. You just repeat the topic. So the question was, what's the process that you go through to tokenize a piece of real estate? So we, in our six step process, we start with structuring, structuring the deal, which includes the security side of it, right? You gotta involve the attorneys. So they start billing right up front. Um, and then the digitization side, that's where we nerds get involved and start coding the corollary on the technology side to the contracts that the law firm is producing. And then we issue it, right? So you're going to have a placement agent or a broker dealer. Somebody actually go and market that and sell that to the investment community. And then you get into just the regular management cycle of the, the securities. Now, what I can tell you, real estate's really interesting because... There is no jurisdiction in the United States where the recorder's office actually recognizes a blockchain-based title to property. So while the technology exists and it's possible to quote unquote tokenize real estate at the right and rim ownership level of the, the title, because the government is running behind in that department at the local county government level where Technology system life cycles are usually about 20 to 30 years. Um, not throwing any darts at anybody, but that's just the stark reality that local governments run way behind in technology innovation. Um, so the next best thing is to create a special purpose vehicle. So you're creating a corporate entity that then has right and rim ownership to that recorded deed, and then you're tokenizing the shares or the limited partnership unit interests of that special purpose vehicle. So then it truly becomes a security at that point as opposed to trading incremental ownership components of the, the title itself. Which, you know, once you peel back the onion and open that can of worms, now you get into cross-jurisdictional tax issues and lots of other acronyms that I'm not qualified to talk about either. I'm just a techie guy. But you know, th these are all areas that eventually there will be answers for. But specifically right now, almost every single project that I've seen involves ownership of a special purpose vehicle security that owns the title of the property. That's good. I know we have more questions. And Michael, if you would be willing to even stay a little bit after if people sure. have specific questions. I have questions. to be in Coleraine at 3.30. Okay. <laughs> That's a window. That's a good window there. So I have one last question that may help a lot of people in the room, and that it comes from uh, one of our members on Zoom, Steve Rogers. What's a good place to learn as a newbie? Is there a, a website or a couple of sources you'd recommend if somebody wants to go further in, in, in this area? Yeah, there's a lot. I mean, keep in mind, Bitcoin has been around now since uh, you know, the, the, the white paper originally came out over a decade ago. So the technology is not new. It, it's literally over a decade old. So there's lots of great resources online. Um, YouTube, you know, watching YouTube videos. What is Bitcoin, right? If you don't know what Bitcoin is, what is blockchain? What is asset tokenization? In fact, we rank between number one and number three for our company in Google search engine optimization for that very question, what is to asset tokenization? So there's lots of great resources that are out there. There's some great publications. Coindesk is one. Cointelegraph is another one. Uh, Decent is another one uh, for decentralization. Uh, so there's some... Um, uh, um, you know, amazing resources, very knowledgeable. Uh, and then it gets into each of those categorical areas, like of the capital stack, right? There's a lot of great crypto knowledgeable attorneys. Um, Twitter is a great spot for those that are on social media, Twitter, especially the crypto Twitter 
uh, scene is pretty robust. I'm not an attorney, but I get invited to like these law conferences and I get to hang out with like <laughs> these crypto lawyers that like to talk about technology and use technology buzzwords, but they really don't know what the heck they're talking about. They're good attorneys, but not good coders. <laughs> So. <laughs> <laughs> They're not good technology solution architects, okay. Right. That's a, hey, Michael, thank you so much. What a wonderful presentation. Thank you. And I will stick around, so if anybody has any questions, I, I know some other hands were up, that I'll stick around for a few, and feel free to hit me up afterwards. So. That'd be great. Thank you so much. Thank you, President Brett. And we've had a lot today, and, and I know we could go much longer, and some people will want to dive deeper. What a great education, what a great overview, and very impressive. Uh, you've heard today, and you might have known this, that one of our goals in Rotary is to fight disease, and we've got a huge campaign that's been going on globally for over 30 years to end polio. And in appreciation of you coming to speak to us today, our club's going to make a donation to the Rotary International and Polio Now campaign. So thank you very much. We appreciate it. And the other thing, and, and I can tell you, we really we could have gone much longer today and, and would have been fascinating. Um, we, as, a, as not just a Rotary club, but internationally, we try to open opportunities for other people. Uh, our club is very focused on opening opportunities for people in need in our community, but also internationally. And uh, this is our theme for the year as Rotary opens opportunities. It's fascinating how the work you and your colleagues and others in what I'll call a new industry have been doing to open up huge opportunities for a lot of investors uh, at even a very low entry level. Uh, but you've opened other opportunities for people to get into the field that you're in. And so in recognition of your work on opening opportunities, I want to give you a Rotary International Open Opportunities pin. So thank you, Michael. And uh, just a couple of quick things. I, I want to thank everybody who joined by Zoom today, as well as the people in the room. Uh, our next meeting, uh, next Thursday, again, will be Barbara Turner speaking to us. She's the CEO of Ohio National Financial Services. And in the meantime, have a great weekend. Meeting adjourned. <laughs>